about, we talked about um, kinetic molecular theory, and that's kind of where we left off. Um, talked about pressure. Um, let's see. So like specifically with the straw, so if you're pushing down on, or not if you're pushing down, there's atmospheric pressure pushing down on the inside of the straw and on the outside of the straw. So when you suck on the end of the straw, you're removing some of that air pressure. Then the pressure outside the straw is greater than inside, and the liquid moves up the straw. Um, and then we moved into kinetic molecular theory, which is these four principles. So I think I posted the link for this as well, but I found this cool sort of simulation of a box here. And so we'll keep coming back to this throughout the lecture today to kind of get a better, more interactive visual of what the different properties of gases or the constraints that we put on them, um, how those affect things. So here we've got, in regards to kinetic molecular theory, we have our collection of particles in constant motion. Uh, we can stop them if we want. There aren't any attractions or repulsions between these. So if you try to track just a single molecule or single particle, it'll keep moving into a straight line until it runs into something or gets hit by something. And then the third part is a lot of space between the particles compared to the size of the particles themselves. Now this is where the simulation is maybe, uh, we've got more particles in here, right? So that would be like, you know, if we just had a few particles, there's a huge amount of space. But of course, if we wanted to simulate actually what particles could look would look like in a box, you could just look at a box full of air because they're so small and the space between them is so large, you wouldn't see anything. Um, and then we can even, let me put just 10 particles in here. The last one is that the speed of the particles increases with increasing temperature. So we can actually take down here, and we can turn up the heat. As you watch those particles, they'll move faster and faster and faster as the temperature goes up. Or we can do the opposite and turn the temperature down. And I think one of the cool things that you can see with the simulation too is that not all of the particles are moving really fast. And not all of the particles, like there's one that one right there in the middle, I just got hit. Some of them are moving slow. So it's the average speed. And of course, if we add more particles, we'll have a lot more speeds sort of um, throughout the container. But we'll come back to this. Let's see here. All right, so those are kinetic molecular theory. So keep, that in, keep these things in mind as they explain everything else. <laughs> Your dad's waving at the door. Uh, so kinetic molecular theory is consistent with the properties of gases. So actually, gases are compressible. I think we did do this slide last time, but with this demonstration, we can actually compress the size of this container. Um, and if you note, so the pressure right now is 35 atmospheres. We can also make this larger, and that'll decrease the pressure. We'll see that later. We'll go back to the here. Uh, so gases are compressible because we have all this space. Uh, right, kinetic molecular theory, a lot of space between the particles compared to the particles of the si size of the particles themselves. So we can take these particles in a gas and compress them, but in a liquid, they're already bumped up right next to each other, so we can't compress it at all. Gases assume the shape of their container. This is because they're moving in constant straight line motion. So it doesn't matter what the shape of the container is, some of them will eventually find their way into every part of that container. And the gases uh, have low densities in comparison with liquids, solids and liquids. Again, this is a fact uh, that comes about because of the amount of space between the particles. If you have all those particles pushed up next to each other, in, uh, let's say, a can of soda, right? They're bumped up side to side. Uh, we put all that space in between them. Now, instead of one can of soda, liquid soda, we have 1,700 cans of soda gas, which might smell nice, I guess. Yeah, we definitely got here. So pressure is a prediction of kinetic molecular theory. Pressure is the result of constant collisions between the particles of the gas and the surfaces around them. And again, because of this, we can drink from straws or inflate basketballs or move air in and out of our lungs. And then variation in pressure uh, causes wind and changes in pressure can help predict 
weather. Uh, and I was trying to track the pressure going from last week into this week. I think it dropped because um, last week was really hot and then suddenly today it rained and now it's super cold. Um, so pressure can help predict that kind of thing. Also wanted to, yeah, switch back to this for a second. So the pressure on the inside of this container here measured in uh, atmospheres is from those particles inside the box colliding with the sides of the walls. So the pressure exerted by a gas sample is defined as the force per unit area. So the one I think we use most often here in North America is, uh, or at least in the US, is PSI. So that's, let me just write it out, pounds per inch squared. So it's how many pounds of force are being put on the walls of the container uh, per inch squared. So we can go back to this simulation. We've got our box, and actually we can switch this to, oh, I can't do PSI here. Atmospheres is another unit of, of pressure, though. So you can see our pressure right now is 16.3 atmospheres. Uh, what do you think is going to happen if I add more particles to the box? Will the pressure go up or will the pressure go down? So if I add more particles, we have more collisions. So if I add these particles, it's another 50. We go up to 23.8, add another 50, that's 31.2. So by adding more particles into the box, really by using this pump here, we increase the pressure inside the box because now there are more particles constantly colliding with the walls. So it's kind of the difference between, shot, between being shot with one Nerf gun and being shot with a thousand Nerf guns. It's a lot more force. Uh, and there are other factors that contribute to this. So if I change the temperature there, right? If we increase the speed of all the particles, now they're colliding faster, which means they have more energy and will give us higher pressure also. Uh, very tangible uh, experience with regard to pressure is, uh, you know, if you drive up to uh, Kings Canyon National Park, Sequoia National Park, the atmospheric pressure is lower but the pressure inside of your ears stays where it was at equilibrium here in the valley. So as you drive up, the pressure decreases outside your ear, but you still have the same pressure inside your ear, and so that pushes your eardrum out. That's part of why, you know, when you pop your ears, you can hear so much better, um, because that tension's reduced. Um, the same thing also happens if you go underwater, but even faster, so just diving 10 feet in a swimming pool will cause pain in your ear where you have to go thousands of feet up to get that same sort of difference in pressure. So the units from the simulation um, and the ones that we use the most are atmospheres. So an atmosphere is the average pressure at sea level. So we kind of normalize to that because it's basically the same all the way around the world. You can look into some stuff about how the moon actually pulls the oceans, and so sea level is different if you're closer to the moon. Um, so the SI unit of pressure is the Pascal, so defined as one Newton per square meter. This is kind of getting into some physics stuff. So it's a Newton in a square meter. Now Pascals, though, are a very tiny unit of force. So one atmosphere is 101,325 pascals. So atmospheres, if we're working at atmospheric pressures, are very, very convenient because they're whole numbers. Uh, more often than not, instead of the pascal, we use the kilopascal. So 101.325 kPa. And you should also recognize that this is a conversion factor. So we can convert between atmospheres, pascals, kilopascals, and the other units of pressure that we'll talk about. 
Um, we don't have these here, but actually at COS we have these mercury barometers. So essentially what you do is you take a tube of mercury and you fill it up completely. So you leave no air in the end. Then while you have the end covered, you dip that end into a bath of mercury. So this is all mercury down here as well. The height of the mercury in the tube to create this vacuum is the pressure, atmospheric pressure. So this was a very practical way to measure atmosphere, or atmospheric pressure. Um, so at sea level, that'll be on average 760 millimeters tall of mercury. So that's millimeters of mercury. Uh, you could do that in inches as well. Today's pressure was 750, I think it was 752 millimeters of mercury. So we're below that average, uh, but we're also at about 300 feet of elevation above sea level. Last week was, actually I think last week on Tuesday it was 757 millimeters of mercury. Uh, you can also do this with water, but your column has to be like 10 meters tall. Uh, so not as practical as mercury. So this is a table from the textbook. This one's going to be very useful um, to memorize some of these units and these conversions, especially these ones here. So one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. One atmosphere is also, or sorry, 760 millimeters of mercury is also equivalent to 760 tor. So aside from having to look up new conversion factors, these should be easy because we've done so much unit converting. Uh, if we have 1.25 atmospheres, we want to convert that into tor. Uh, what's our conversion factor going to be for one atmosphere or for atmospheres to tor? Yeah, so one atmosphere is equal to 760 tor. So I'm going to have atmospheres in the denominator or the numerator? Yeah. So if we put atmospheres in the denominator, then our atmospheres cancel. Uh, let me get out a calculator. All right, so one atmosphere, 760 tor is one atmosphere. So we want to cancel out our units of atmospheres so that we're left with units of tor. So 1.25 times 760 give us 950 tor. All right. And then if we have 30.15 inches of mercury, and we want to convert that to millimeters of mercury, this one is actually an interesting one because uh, if you think about what we're measuring here, for both of these, it's based on the height of a mercury column. So if we have this column of mercury, the height of this is just being measured in either millimeters of mercury, or we can measure it in inches of mercury. So really, we can just convert from inches to millimeters or millimeters to inches. Uh, so if that's more comfortable for you, you can do that. Or we can still use 29.92 inches of mercury and convert it to 760 millimeters of mercury. So if we have 30.15 inches, the units that we want here are millimeters of mercury. So we'll put that on top. And we'll put 29.92 inches of mercury on the bottom. So that gives us 30.15 times 760 divided by 29.92. So we'll get, whoa, 
765.8 uh, millimeters of mercury. So they're just unit conversions. Like any other units, we've just got some new conversion factors. And really a whole conversion table, because we can convert between all of these just using that table. Oh, right. So 173 inches of mercury. We want to convert this to PSI. So pounds per square inch is PSI. Uh, so this will be 29.92 and 14.7. I'm not going to spend too much time here because, again, just unit conversions. So that'll be 173 uh, times 14.7 divided by 29.92. So we'll have 84, oh, that's right, 84.9966, right, 57. So this will round to 84, sorry, not 84, 85.0 PSI. Okay, now let's get into the, to the gas laws. Got uh, two or three, four, four gas laws that we'll talk about that are like the initial gas laws when chemists were first doing this kind of research and they said, okay, well, what happens if I keep the temperature the same but change the pressure or change the volume? Um, specifically here, the Boyle's law is the relationship between pressure and volume. So the pressure of a gas sample depends in part on its volume. So if the temperature, this is going to be a theme here, if the temperature and the amount of gas are constant. So if we're holding the temperature the same, if we're holding the number of particles of gas or the moles of gas in the container the same, i.e. constant, the pressure of a gas sample increases for decrease in volume. So, yeah, if pressure goes up, or pressure, I should say, goes up when volume goes down. And the opposite is true also. So pressure will go down if volume goes up. Actually, yeah, before we even get to the, let's go back to this. Let's see if all of our, yep, all of our gas particles left. Eventually just leaked out the top there. So I'm gonna close this. And then I gotta add some particles in here. Well, let's see, we want, is it this one? I think it's this one. No, that changes the temperature. I want, okay, constant temperature. So now our temperature will stay the same uh, at 265 Kelvin. That's up there at the, where's my mouse? Uh -huh, up here. So 265. constant temperature, that'll stay the same. And then we're not going to add any more particles to the box and we're not going to take anything out. So our pressure right now is 11 atmospheres. Actually, let me adjust. I can't adjust that for planar. Let's make this 10 meters, or 10 nanometers, actually. So pressure is, or volume is 10 nanometers, well, by however tall the box is. And our pressure here is 10.3 atmospheres. So if I go back to this, so if the volume goes down, pressure should go up. This one, that. 
So if I cut this box volume, let's do it in half, we're down to five, our pressure jumps up to 20.6. And then we can go back out to 10, pressure's back to 10.3, and then if we increase the size, our pressure goes down. So the reason this happens is because of the number of collisions of the particles with the size of the box. So if the temperature is the same, that means the particles are still moving at the same speed. And we have this collision counter here. So at this largest volume, the 15 nanometer box, we'll do it a few times. First one was 140, 136. And let's see what we get there, 135, right? So we're 135 collisions in what is 10 picoseconds. This is all scaled. And that's our lowest pressure. So if I decrease the volume of this box, that means that the particles have to travel a shorter distance from one side of the box to the other. So we're gonna have more collisions. So I'll go from 15 and I'll actually go down to seven and a half. So I'll cut this thing in half. So our pressure goes up to 13.7. And now if we do the collision counter again, for that same period of time, we now have 203 collisions where we had 134 before. So our pressure increases because our particles are hitting the size of the box more often. And this applies to any container. Okay, so we can put this though into math terms. Oh, right, there's a static here example. All right, so a uh, practical application of this is a bike pump. So you can pump your bike tires up to hundreds of PSI, uh, which you should only do if that's what your bike tires say they should be at. By taking this bike pump, when you pull up on the bike handle, bike pump handle, the volume increases, the pressure decreases, uh, but there's a one-way valve at the bottom that lets the gas from outside in. Then when you flip this around, you push the handle down, you're decreasing the volume of the pump, so you're increasing the pressure, and then that goes into your bike tube. So the mathematical relationship then, uh, which was discovered by Robert Boyle, and assumes constant temperature and constant number of particles, uh, we have an inverse, inversely proportional relationship between pressure and volume. It's inverse because as we increase one, the other one goes down. And the nice thing about it being perfectly proportional is if we take our pressure, actually we can do this with the box again. So if we have this box, we go to 10 meters, 10 nanometers, we have this box at 10.3 atmospheres. So if our pressure is, oh, that's right, you can only see that. 10.3, if we go and cut this box size in half, we should see our pressure double. It jumps up to 20.6. So uh, yeah, doubling one cuts the other one in half. And then this is the equation to remember, Boyle's Law. Uh, so there's this experiment with a, uh, a manometer, which measures the pressure, um, well, measures pressure. And here again, we're using the difference in the height of mercury between these two sides. So you can measure the volume of the gas sample in here. And if you double the height of this column of mercury, you double the pressure and decrease the volume inside. And when you plot, our pressure in millimeters of mercury against the volume of this side of the container, you get this curve. Um, and curves aren't the easiest thing to work with, but if you take your pressure, and instead of writing down exactly what the pressure is, you write one over pressure, right? So, so like one over 200 millimeters of mercury, let's say this curve becomes a perfectly straight line. 
So that's how we know that this relationship is proportional and how we know it's actually inversely proportional. So like we saw with the other, with the box, if we have this piston with a sliding, uh, or the sliding piston with a handle, if our volume decreases with the same number of gas particles, there are more collisions with the walls leading to higher pressure because it takes less time for the particle to bounce from one side to the other, meaning more collisions, because they're all moving at the same speed. So in terms of the kinds of questions that would be written for this, if a cylinder is equipped with a movable piston, has an applied pressure of three atmospheres, and a volume of five liters, what is the volume of the cylinder if the pressure is decreased to two atmospheres? So like I mentioned, we're gonna have like four different, one of them's not really different. We're gonna have like three kind of unique equations that we're gonna use. Um, and then we'll get to the, the ideal gas law. So the way you wanna figure out which equation you actually need to use uh, will usually be by writing them all out. So at this point, we only have the one, but it's this up here. So this is Boyle's law. So for this equation, to be able to use it, we need to have a starting pressure and a starting volume, and we need to have an ending pressure and an ending volume. And we're, we need to be looking for just one of those. So for this equation, we have three atmospheres as our starting pressure. So that'll be P1. And then we have a starting volume of five liters, which will be V1. So P1, V1, P2, V2. So with the starting applied pressure of 3.0 atmospheres, and 5.0 liters, we want to know what the volume of the cylinder is if the pressure is decreased to 2.0 atmospheres, leaving volume as the thing we're solving for. Um, this maybe is more applicable to homework questions than it is to ones that I'll write on a test, because they'll always try to tell you, you know, this is a pressure, this is a volume, but you should know that based on the units. So if you see atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, tor, PSI even, those are all units of pressure. For volume, we'll really just have liters or milliliters. Um, and then we can take these and we just plug them into the equation. And this is where uh, if your algebra is really rough, you should brush up on it for these because the gas law um, problems involve a lot of rearranging equations. Okay, so we got pressure one, three atmospheres, times our volume one, which is 5.0 liters, equals our pressure two, which is 2.0 atmospheres, and then V2 is what we're looking for. All right, so that's our unknown. So to solve this, we need to get V2 by itself. Because right? if we get V2 by itself, then it will be, you know, whatever number we calculate over here equals V2. So the first step here would be divide both sides by 2.0 atmospheres. Because on our right side of the equation, if we take 2.0 atmospheres and divide by 2.0 atmospheres, that equals one. So we've eliminated it from that side of the equation. And then on the left side, and I think this is, uh, if, your, if your math skills, your math chops are good enough, this can be really helpful. The gas laws can all really be solved with just dimensional analysis. So on our left side, we have Units of atmospheres being divided by units of atmospheres. So those cancel out. And the only unit we're left with is liters, which is a unit of volume, which is what we're trying to solve for. 
This will be even more important when we get to the ideal gas law. All right, so we'll take our 3.0 then times 5.0, give us 15, and then divide by 2.0. And since those atmosphere units canceled out, we have 7.5 liters equals V2. Uh, so yeah, ideal or the gas laws, great candidates for your cheat sheet. <laughs> yeah, Boyle's law explains why ascending uh, too quickly when you're scuba diving is dangerous, because the regulator, your air tank pressure regulator, is constantly adjusting to match external pressure. So if you're down at 20 meters underwater, your lungs are actually experiencing three atmospheres of pressure. So for you to take a deep breath and then quickly ascend back to the surface, now your lungs aren't holding, well, your lungs are still holding three atmospheres of pressure, but the pressure outside is now only one atmosphere. So you're going to feel two atmospheres of pressure in your lungs, which sounds terrible. You won't be able to hold your breath. Because this regulator is, is dumb, right? It just knows what the pressure is outside and what the pressure is inside. It's just adjusting to the outside pressure. Um, this also happens, we'll talk about this more in a later chapter, but as you go down to higher pressures, you can dissolve more and more gases into your blood, in particular nitrogen. And I believe it's called the bends is when you get too much nitrogen in your blood, or it's the opposite when you come back out. Um, but that's another danger. Um, and again, that's, that's Boyle's law. The volume of your lungs doesn't change, but the pressure does. So we'll try to expand to three times their size. Ugh. There's some cool stuff you can do with this though. Actually, have you guys seen the, uh, when they take down like the super deep sea submarines, uh, and they'll attach like a styrofoam cup to it, and it'll be like one of those giant like double gulp, or like a triple gulp, giant styrofoam cup. They take it down to super, super deep, and it shrinks up to like tiny. One of the reasons styrofoam is so light and the reason it insulates is because it has a ton of air trapped in it. So when you take it down super deep, all that pressure squishes the air out and compresses the styrofoam. Uh, you can also do this kind of thing to figure out how deep you've gone, if you're careful enough. So we'll say a snorkeler takes a syringe filled with 16 milliliters of air from the surface. All right, so it's surface pressure of one atmosphere. And they take that down to an unknown depth. Uh, they take a look at that syringe, and the syringe is now only 7.5 milliliters. What is the pressure at this depth? So we've got a two-parter here. And then if the, pressure, if the pressure increases by an additional one atmosphere, excuse me, for every 10 meters of depth, how deep is the snorkeler? So for the first part of this, remember Boyle's law is P1V1 equals P2V2. So we were given a volume and an initial pressure, and we have an ending volume, uh, and we're asked to find that ending pressure. So those will all slot nicely into Boyle's law P1, V1, P2, V2. So our pressure at the start is one atmosphere, and we've got 16 mils in the syringe. We get down to depth, uh, and we don't know what the pressure is, but our syringe now only has 7.5 milliliters of air. So if we want to know the pressure at that depth, We'll just plug these into Boyle's law. So our pressure one is 1.0 atmospheres times 16 milliliters 
equals pressure 2, what we're looking for, times 7.5 milliliters. Um, quick note, for Boyle's Law, the units just have to match on either side. Everybody tonight. <sighs> um, the units only matter that they, the only thing that matters about units is that they match on either side. That won't be the case for everything, but as long as we have milliliters on one side and we have milliliters on the other, we're okay. If we have atmospheres on one side, atmospheres on the other, we'll be good. Uh, because we need those units to cancel. So again, just like that other problem, we'll divide here, but by 7.5 milliliters this time. Last time we did pressure. And again, these will cancel on this side. Milliliters will cancel here. So we're left with just atmospheres. So we get 1 times 16 divided by 7.5. 2.5. 1, because we have two sig figs, so it's just 2.1. So say 2.1 atmospheres is the pressure at the depth the diver was at. All right, so now, how do we convert that 2.1 atmospheres and figure out how far the deep diver went, how deep the diver dove? Word sentence. Yes, we do just multiply by 10. And again, we can use dimensional analysis here. So we have 2.1 atmospheres, and we know that we gain an additional atmosphere for every 10 meters of depth, or one atmosphere per 10 meters. So we can say that this is 10 meters, and then one atmosphere. So he was 21 meters deep when he took a look at that syringe. And I think if you're just snorkeling, that's pretty accurate, but also that's pretty deep. 20 million meters is a long ways. Cool. So that was Boyle's Law. Now we'll have Charles' Law. So before we had the relationship between pressure and volume, there's also a relationship between volume and temperature. Uh, and Charles' Law explains why hot air balloons rise. Because if you heat a gas, it increases the volume of that gas. So then, because we're not changing the mass of the gas, we have the same amount of mass, but now in a larger volume. So this is like saying, um, Right, if we divide by bigger and bigger numbers, our number gets smaller. Right? So uh, let's just say our mass is 100 grams and we have a volume of 10, let's call it meters cubed. Right? Our density would be uh, 10 grams per meter cubed. But if we heat up that air and now we still have 100 grams of air in 100 meters cubed, our density would just be one gram per meter cube. And so if that volume keeps getting bigger, but it's the same amount of gas, and therefore the same mass of gas, it gets less and less dense. And having a lower density than air is why hot air balloons float. And wood floats in water because it has a lower density than the water. Uh, there is a caveat with this one, so I, like I mentioned before, with Boyle's Law, units just have to match. For Charles' Law, we have to be using temperature in Kelvin. Uh, and the example problem, I'll show you why. Uh, but it's this relationship that actually predicts what absolute zero is. So if you took a bunch of measurements up here at reasonable temperatures, like 0, 60, 120 degrees Celsius, and you take this line, straight line, and extrapolate it backwards to zero, it crosses zero at negative 273 degrees Celsius. 
um, which is essentially where all of the atoms stop moving at all. They're not moving, they're not vibrating, they are perfectly still. So, yeah, negative value is impossible. So we actually use this, uh, or the scale we use here is Kelvin, because zero Kelvin equals negative 273 degrees C. So let's actually pop over to this, or maybe real quick. So Charles Law here, um, the volume of a gas and its Kelvin temperature is directly proportional. So if pressure and volume are inversely proportional, one goes up, the other one goes down, a directly proportional relationship means that when one goes up, the other also goes up. So if we heat something up, it's going to get bigger. If we cool it down, it's going to get smaller. Oh, yeah. This guy. All right. So our molecules, just our particles here, are still bouncing around. I need to. Actually, no. Let's leave this at five. So then I can do this one. Ah, yeah. Okay, so now, um, yeah, it's too small. So now we're looking at changing our temperature and how that affects the volume. So you measure the hot air balloon as we heat things up. Oop, it switched back. This one, yeah. So as we heat things up, the box has to get bigger because we're holding pressure. We're holding pressure constant. And we're holding, again, the number of particles inside the box constant. Right? We're not adding or removing any of those particles. So to keep pressure constant, we have to keep heating, or as we heat it up, we have to increase the size of the box. Uh, so let me cool this back down, actually. So if we cool this down so that we're back to 5 nanometers wide, let's measure these collisions again. It's a lot of collisions, 281. We'll do three just to get an idea of what it is on average, 284, uh, and 281. Okay, so what do you think is gonna happen to the number of collisions per 10 picoseconds if I heat this box up and it gets wider? Yeah, it should stay the same. Because if you think about this, we wanna keep the same pressure um, so as we're heating things up, you can probably tell too, the particles are moving faster now. So to keep the pressure the same, we have to give them a longer distance to travel. So there's more time between those collisions. So now that we're up to 11, measure this again, 278. Do it again, 261. Uh, 242. So it is a little bit lower, but I think within experimental error, right? It's roughly the same. Um, yeah, so that's Charles' law. Basically, in terms of kinetic molecular theory, pressure is the same, number of particles is the same. If they're moving faster, we have to have more space so that our collisions are, I guess collisions are occurring with the same frequency. Wait a second. Right, yes, they're occurring with the same frequency and not faster. Because we can put the volume constant, and if I heat this up now with the constant volume, our pressure goes up. Yeah. So we have to have longer distance because they're traveling faster, so they collide at the same rate. Yeah, so I heated up, and now it's 321. So again, kinetic molecular theory is really explaining the why of all of these things. But in terms of the equation, you need to remember V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. 
And here we're constant pressure, constant amount of gas. So if we double the temperature of a gas sample, its volume doubles. Actually, I guess we didn't quite look at that, did we? Let's go take a look at that. Uh, this is not going to be a easy, super easy way to see the volume doubling or not. Because we don't have the volume of the box, we just have the width of the box. So for like 500, and that's 6.8. If we go up to 1,000, roughly works out. So 6.8, now it's like 14. Okay, but again, temperature has to be expressed in Kelvin. So it's only when the Kelvin temperature doubles that we see this. Because obviously if we're in Celsius, well, this is just one of the reasons that we have to be in Kelvin. Uh, if we're in Celsius and we have 10 degrees Celsius, doubling 10 degrees Celsius would just take us to 20 degrees Celsius, where 10 degrees C is 283 Kelvin. So to actually double our volume, we'd have to do 283 times two, which is 566 Kelvin. So relationship only holds when we're using temperature in Kelvin. Yep, and it's a, a line, y equals mx plus b, where b is our y-intercept, uh, which is zero uh, for Kelvin. And again, if the temperature of a gas sample is increased, the gas particles move faster. For the pressure to remain constant, the volume must be increased. So that it takes this, so we get the same number of collisions because they have to travel farther uh, to hit, bounce from one side to the other. Are there any questions at this point? I've not been pausing much, sorry. You could do this one at home too with a balloon. Um, so if you take your, take a balloon, put it in ice water, it'll shrink. If you put it in boiling water, then it'll get bigger. And dry ice is less than $2 a pound at Winco. Got some the other weekend. Lots so of fun. Oh. Probably. Probably. More converting. More converting. <laughs> We'll see, it depends, it depends on, well, so this will all be on a quiz, so probably not. There will probably be like a question or two though where you do have to convert. Or a question that's like, you know, what units do you need to use Charles Law? Multiple choice type thing. Okay, again though, let's, let's apply this. This is what you guys really care about. Uh, if we have a sample of gas, has a volume, 2.8 liters, at an unknown temperature, when the sample is submerged in ice water at zero degrees C, its volume decreases to 2.57 liters. So we wanna know the initial temperature in Kelvin and in Celsius. So obviously it says Charles Law here. And we're gonna use Charles Law, but you know, you're not gonna have that much uh, hint on an exam or a quiz. So this is Boyle's Law. And then our Charles law is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So that's Charles. So if you have your cheat sheet and you've got these equations on it, you look at your uh, word problem here, you see, okay, we've got liters. It says it here too, volume, right? So volume in liters. Uh, so both of these have volume. But then we're given a temperature. And you can say at that point, it's like, oh, Boyle's law doesn't involve temperatures. And if you look through the rest of this, we're not given a pressure. So we can't be using Boyle's law because we have temperature and we don't have pressure. But for Charles' law, we have volume and temperature, so that's what we'll be using. 
So V1, T1 equals V2, T2. So volume one will be 2.80 liters. Our initial temperature, or T1, is unknown. We can leave that as a question mark. V2 is 2.57 liters. And T2 is zero degrees Celsius. So the first thing we have to do is convert our degrees Celsius into Kelvin. Um, so let me just, I'm gonna do this in, I can't do it in red because you can't tell that it's red. You see that? That still doesn't look orange. So find which colors does this projector actually able to do? Does that look green? Is anybody out there too colorblind to tell that that's green? No, it's not yellow. <laughs> that's terrible. That's okay. Good for it was, we could do this. That that's better. Good. That's better. Okay. So I'm doing this in this color because it's wrong. But this is what happens. And this is why we can't have temperature be in degrees Celsius. If we do, uh, so we got V1 over T1. So that's going to be 2.80 liters over. I'm going to erase this in a second. Over T1, because we're trying to solve that. We'll have V2 is 2.57 liters over 0 degrees Celsius. Now we have 2.57 divided by 0. And there's like one thing you can't do in math, and that's divide by 0. And then if we were to multiply to move this 0 over here, well, now we've got 2.8 times 0, so that's 0. Now we have 0 divided by T1, that's 0. So all of the math falls apart if you use degrees Celsius. If you do use degrees Celsius and you have zero, if you don't have zero, you could very well go throughout the whole problem, get the wrong answer, and not know it. So we gotta convert to Kelvin. So we had 273.15, whoops, not degree C. So this will be 273.15 Kelvin. And then one other trick that I want to show you here. So the equation as it's written is V1 over T1 oops, equals V2 over T2. If you have a hard time with algebra, the way we're going to end up with this problem is we're going to have to solve for this T1, which is in the denominator, which means we need to move it to the numerator and then move everything to the other side. Um, so you can take a little bit of a shortcut here and just rewrite this as T1 over V1 equals T2 over V2. If you want to prove it to yourself later, you can do the algebra because you can rearrange that one on the left. You can rearrange this to get that. They're the same, essentially the same equation, but a little bit easier to solve if you're trying to find one of the temperatures. So let's use this one and we'll plug in our T1 is what we're solving for. T1 over 2.80 liters. Our T2 is 273.15 Kelvin. And that's over 2.57 liters. So then all we have to do to solve this is we multiply both sides by 2.80 liters. And again, uh, right, this will cancel. And then on the right side, our units of liters will cancel. And we're left with units of Kelvin, which is what we're looking for. We'll just have T1 equal to 273.15 times 2.80 Kelvin liters, 2.57 liters. So 273.15 times 2.80 equals that divided by 2.57. Of course, I always run out of space. 
So T1 is 297. Uh, we only have three sig figs, so it's 298 Kelvin. And then if we subtract T73.15 from that, that's 24.4 degrees C. So to go back from Kelvin to Celsius, we just subtract 273. 273.15. All good there? Cool. All right, we'll do this. Uh, do this next example, and then we'll take a little break like five minutes, come back. We'll round this out to seven o'clock, call it a night. So if we have a gas in a cylinder with a movable piston, that's that thing from the other, from just a couple slides ago. All right, cylinder, gas in here. Has an initial volume of 88.2 milliliters and is heated from 36 degrees C to 155 degrees C. What is the final volume of the gas in milliliters? So again, we could pull up both of the equations that we've been working with so far. We see that, oh, we've got temperatures, we don't have any pressures, so we can't use Boyle's law. So we're gonna use Charles' law. So we'll have V1, T1, V2, T2. So our V1 is going to be 88.2 milliliters. T1 is 36 point, whoops, 36 degrees C. V2 is what we're looking for. T2 is 155 degrees C. So we can't use degree C, we have to use Kelvin. So plus 273.15 plus 273.15 36 plus 309.15 Kelvin. Oops, brightness all the way up. 428.15 Kelvin. So like I showed you on that last one, Charles' law can look like V2, or volume over temperature, or it can be temperature over volume. And the easier one to solve is the one where the unknown is, on, is in a numerator. So because we're looking for volume, we're gonna be using this form of the equation. And then again, as a note on units, we're looking for our final volume in milliliters. So having our initial volume in milliliters is ideal. Uh, you could convert that into liters if you wanted to solve for liters. You could convert it at the beginning or you can convert at the end. Um, the only units that really matter are uh, temperature being in Kelvin. So we got 88.2 milliliters over our T1, which is 309.15 equals our V which we're looking for, divided by 428.15 Kelvin. And again, we just multiply both sides by 428.15 Kelvin. And our units here will cancel, right? This will cancel out completely. 
Kelvin will cancel here, and we'll be left with just units of milliliters. So 428.15 times 88.2 divided by 309.15. Means that our final volume is going to be 122, only 366. So 122 milliliters equals V2. If you struggle with the math, but you have a decent grasp of the concepts, you can also check your answer. Um, because we know for Charles, if you know that for Charles' law, heating things up, the volume has to get bigger. Then you could look at your initial volume as 88.2, and then your final volume and say, well, my temperature went up, my volume should be bigger. Um, and if it's not, then you should check your math. Make sure you convert it to Kelvin, that kind of thing. We can take Charles' law, we can take Boyle's law, and we can actually combine them together into the combined gas law. Very, very fancy, well thought out name. Uh, combined gas law just takes Charles' law, which is this top part, or sorry, Boyle's law, right? P1V1 equals P2V2. And we take Charles' law, which is the V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, and we put them together. So now we can change pressure and we could change volume and figure out what the temperature would be at the end or vice versa. I mean, we could change any two variables now instead of just being able to change one. Let's go back up there. Uh, and just like for Charles' law, the temperature has to be in Kelvins. So it kind of inherits that uh, restriction. But again, it works just like Boyle and Charles' law, where we just plug things in. So we have a sample of gas with an initial volume, 158 milliliters at a pressure of 735 millimeters of mercury and a temperature of 34 degrees C. If we compress that gas to a volume of 108 milliliters and heat it to a temperature of 85 degrees C, what is the final pressure in millimeters of mercury? So again, if you're just looking at this in exam, you've got just a list of gas laws. We would know Boyle's law, P1V1 equals P2V2. We'd have Charles law, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And now we have the combined gas law. Which combines those two things. So the key distinction is, are two variables changing at the same time? So we have volume, we have pressure, we have temperature. Then we have another volume. So is that variable changing? Well, 158 is bigger than 108, so it did change. And our temperature changed as well from 34 degrees C to 85 degrees C. So we have two variables changing at the same time, which means that we have to use the combined gas law to be able to account for both of those. So now we can write down P1, V1, and T1, as well as P2, V2 and T2. So P1 will be 735 millimeters of mercury. V1 will be 158 milliliters. And T1, 34 degrees C. Uh, our final pressure, as I've highlighted here, is what we're looking for. So we don't know what that is. 
but we have a second volume and we have a second temperature. Uh, so we need to change Celsius into Kelvin. So this will be 34 plus 273. Uh, whoops, 34 plus 273.15, 307.15 Kelvin. 85 plus 273.15. So that will give us 358.15 Kelvin. Uh, you can, for the combined gas law, use the same trick that I showed you for Charles law. So if you're solving for a temperature here, temperature is in the denominator, you could flip both sides to put temperature in the numerator and make it just a little bit easier to solve. Uh, here we don't have to do that but though because we're solving for pressure. Pressure is already in the numerator, uh, so we don't have to do that. So P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. So 35 millimeters of mercury, 158 milliliters, and then divide by 307.15 Kelvin. And then our P2 is what we're looking for. So that'll be multiplied by 108 milliliters and divided by 358.15 Kelvin. Oh, I will say also, uh, if you'd rather, you could always rearrange the equation beforehand to solve for the answer that you want. Um, you don't have to. Uh, right, so didn't give myself enough space again. So to get pressure by itself, whoops, we've got the right side here. We're going to multiply by the inverse of 108 over 358.15. So we're going to be multiplying by 358.15 Kelvin over 108 milliliters. And we'll do the exact same thing on the other side. So on our right side, these cancel, which is exactly what we need. And then looking at the left side, we'll now have Kelvin divided by Kelvin, and we'll have well, milliliters divided by milliliters, leaving our only units that don't cancel as millimeters of mercury. So this will be 358.15 times 735 times 158 is a big number, divided by 108, divided by 307.15. So we get 1,253.819, uh, yeah. I mean, we've got to round this further because sig figs. So that'll be P2. Um, so this goes back a little bit. Don't do a lot of addition and subtraction, uh, but remember when we do this addition here, we keep the smallest number of sig figs, or sorry, not the smallest number of sig figs, the smallest number of decimal places. So zero decimal places. So these aren't significant. So this is three sig figs and the same here, this is three sig figs. So our final answer should have three sig figs because this is only three, this is three. Uh, and to do that, we'll need scientific notation. So this will be 1.25 times 10 to the three 
millimeters of mercury. So it's a lot of numbers, but it is mostly plug and chug with a little hint of uh, algebra, just rearranging equations. Do another one of these. So again, we're going to be using combined gas law. T1, V1 over T1, T2, V2 over T2. So we have a balloon with a volume of 7.3, or sorry, 3.7 liters at a pressure of 1.1 atmospheres and a temperature of 30 degrees C. If the balloon is submerged in water to a depth where the pressure is 4.7 atmospheres and the temperature is 15 degrees C, what will its volume be? Assume that any changes in pressure caused by the skin of the balloon are negligible. Don't worry about that line. We're just working with these numbers then. So our P1, well, what is our pressure one? 1.1 atmospheres. Are units of atmospheres okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then our volume one? 3.7 liters. Our temperature one? Yeah, 30 degrees Celsius, but we will have to come back for that. It's not really that, but okay. Uh, pressure two? 0.7 atmospheres. Our temperature or our volume two is our unknown. And temperature two is 15 degrees C. So we need to convert those temperatures. Can't do anything in degrees C. So 30 plus 273.15. 303.15. Fifteen plus two seventy three point one five is two eighty eight point one five. So should we use should we use the trick to flip this equation upside down? Yes. Correct. We don't need to flip it because we're solving for volume. Volume's already in the numerator, it's already on top. So this will be the easiest way to solve it. It's going to be 1.1 atmospheres times 3.7 liters divided by 303.15 Kelvin. Uh, and that equals 4.7 atmospheres times V2 over 288.15 Kelvin. Just a bit. All right, so what am I going to multiply? Ah, what? what am I going to multiply by on the right side here so that I can get V2 by itself? Yeah, the inverse of those numbers, which is 288.15 Kelvin over 4.7 atmospheres. And then we have to multiply by the same thing on the other side. So those will cancel out. And then our units, we can just double check here. Kelvin will be divided by Kelvin. Atmospheres will be divided by atmospheres. We'll get 288 times 1.1 times 3.7. Oops. 288.15. There we go. Cool. 
yeah, divided by 4.7, divided by 303.15. So 0 0.82 liters will equal V2. Now let's just do a little logic check. So we went from 1.1 atmospheres to 4.7 atmospheres. So based on just the pressure, should our volume have gone up or down? Right, should have gone down. And it did, we went from 3.7 liters to 0 0.82, so that's good. But we've got two things in play here. Um, and so our temperature went from 303.15 Kelvin down to 288.15, which means that our, temp our volume should have gone down again by that other factor as well. So fortunately, both of these are going down. Sometimes it can get a little bit tricky and you have to think about the magnitude of how much one went down versus the magnitude of how much one goes up. So here, our pressure went from 1.1 to 4.7. So that's more than four times the pressure. Our volume though, really only went down by a small amount respectively, right? So most of our volume change then was because of this increase in pressure and not necessarily the change in temperature. To get an equivalent change in volume from temperature, we'd have to decrease the volume by four times or one fourth. And so you could feasibly get a situation where your volume or your pressure increases by four times, but your temperature also increases by four times. And so there would be no change in volume because we've kind of flipped the parameters. All right, so the last one that we're gonna talk about uh, is Avogadro's law, which is a relationship between volume and moles. So how many particles of gas are in our container? So to pop back over here to this, we still got these particles bouncing around um, with volume and moles. So I'm gonna hold temperature constant. So if I, oh, that's right, pressure's gonna change. So if I move this pump, I think it's just gonna hold, yeah, okay. We don't want constant volume. What we really want is constant. Oh yeah, yeah, here we go. So if I add more particles to this container, every time I add particles, the chamber has to get bigger because now we have more things colliding with the size of the container. So as, as our number of moles, oh wait, you can't see that. As moles goes up, volume has to go up to have constant pressure. And if moles goes down, volume has to go down. So is that a direct relationship or an inverse relationship? It's a direct proportion. So which equation is this gonna look like? The second one. Charles Law. Yeah, no, this is something that I always mixed up, is this P1, V1 equals P2. So this is Boyle's Law. Ah, what the? Um, P2, V2. For whatever reason, when I look at this, it feels like a direct relationship. It's not. It's the inverse relationship. So definitely understand that. Um, yeah, so this is going to have the same setup. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Uh, as Charles' law, except now we've got moles instead of temperature. So it'll be V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. Another direct proportion. So this was, uh, uh, yeah, Amadeo Avogadro, also Avogadro's number, also known for, I should say. We're assuming constant temperature and pressure. 
So the volume of a gas and the amount of gas are directly proportional. As long as the gas is in moles. Because when it's in moles, um, that's a direct relationship with the number of particles in the container. So another equation to remember. I think this one's also kind of the most tangible because you think about like a balloon, if you blow into the balloon, you're adding gas to the balloon. You're adding more moles of gas, so the balloon gets bigger to keep the pressure and the temperature the same. All right, so now just as a quick recap, we've got P1, V1 equals P2, V2. That's Boyle, we've got Charles Law, V1, T1 equals V2 over T2. That's Charles. Those have our combined. PV equals T. And now V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. So each of these separate equations, I mean, the combined gas law is, is a combination of Boyle's and Charles, um, but we're all look, each of these is looking sort of at different aspects of a gas, holding all the other things constant. So if you're looking at a problem, again, 4.8 liters of sample of helium gas contains 0.22 moles of helium. How many additional moles of helium gas must be added to the sample to obtain a volume 6.4 liters. So we don't have pressure and we don't have temperature, so we can't possibly use Boyle's law or Charles law and thereby the combined gas law. So we can only use Avogadro's. Oops, V1, N1, V2, N2. So volume one is 4.8 liters. 0 0.22 moles. We're going to a, we want a new volume of 6.4 liters. Um, so how many moles of gas do we have to add? This one, this equation, just like Charles' law, and just like the combined gas law, we can flip it to make it a little easier to work with. Um, and because we're looking for number of moles, which is in the denominator, in this version of the equation. We're gonna to wanna to flip this. So it'll be N1 over V1 equals N2 over V2. And then it's just plug the numbers in. Uh, 0 0.22 over 4.8, or units in. And then N is what we're looking for over 6.8 four liters. So we can just multiply both sides by 6.4 liters. And again, this cancels on this side. Units of liters will cancel over here to leave us with moles. 6.4 times 0.22 divided by 4.8 will be 0 0.29 moles. So really, in terms of complexity, none of these equations by themselves is very complicated. I think the most difficult thing is remembering which one you need to use. But there, I would say, memorize you know, which units are volume, which units are pressure. Um, and then just look through the question, try and match them up with the equation that has all of the things, all of the units that you have in the question. And it's just a little bit of algebra. So again, we're gonna be using Avogadro's here. So we have a chemical reaction occurring in a cylinder equipped with a movable piston. So think car engine. Uh, produces 0 0.58 moles of a gas product. If the cylinder contained 0 
one, one moles of gas before the reaction and had an initial volume of 2.1 liters, what was its volume after the reaction? So again, V1, N1, V2, N2. Uh, and then we're going to have an initial volume of 2.1 liters, uh, initial number of moles is 0 0.11 moles. And this is where you really do have to read the question and um, place these things in time together. It says 0 0.11 moles before the reaction, even though it, it, the first number it gives us is 0 0.58 moles, which is definitely a common mistake. Uh, so the volume after the reaction is what we're looking for. That's V2. And after the reaction, we have 0 0.58 moles of gaseous product. So because this is V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2, we don't need to flip the equation because uh, we're looking for V2. So V1, let me just type these numbers, put these numbers in. Uh, 2.1 liters over 0 0.11 moles equals V2 over 0 0.58 moles. So multiply both sides by 0 0.58. You get 0.58 times 2.1 divided by 0.11. So this will be 11. Actually, this will be 11. 11 liters equals V2. Again, we can look at these and see if our answer makes any sense. Uh, if our number of moles goes from 0.11 to 0.58, that's about five times bigger. So our volume should be about five times bigger. So 2.1 to 11, it's about five times as big. So our answer makes sense. All right, now, the last thing we'll do here, introduce the uh, ideal gas law. So we can take, well, the limitation of Boyle's law, Charles' law, combined gas law, Alvogadro's law, is that you have to know the initial conditions to be able to calculate the final conditions, or you need the final conditions to be able to calculate the initial conditions. The only thing you can do is look at changes. If I told you I have a balloon that's got one mole of gas in it, at you know, 273 degrees Kelvin, and the pressure is one atmosphere, you couldn't tell me how big that balloon is uh, with any of the laws that we have, because nothing's changed. That's all that Boyle's, Charles, and the combined and Avogadro's laws, that's all they do. The combination of those laws lets us do that. So that's the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, which many people will often say is uh, phonetically spelled is PIVNERT, PV equals NRT. Um, and the key to all of this is the ideal gas constant, which is this number, 0 0.0821. Uh, and the units here are really important. Liters, atmospheres, per mole, Kelvin. Uh, you'll notice that liters is the units for volume, atmospheres is the unit for pressure, moles is the units for moles, or the amount of gas, and Kelvin is what we use for temperature. And this is really for any gas at any regular temperature, pressure, and volume, you'll calculate this number. If you know all of those things, you can calculate R, which is 0, 0.0. 821. So in lab last week, we used a different value for R. 
And that's because that, which was like, I think it was 62, that was in liters, millimeters of mercury per mole Kelvin. So I just kind of gave you that. So for whatever units you have for R, those are the units that you have to use in PV equals NRT. So that's why last week we did everything in millimeters of mercury. So I gave you this version of R. Most stuff though will be using liters, atmospheres, and mole Kelvin. So you'll use this value of R. Which is why it's important to be able to convert between things. Uh, yeah. So this table I think is interesting to look at because it shows you how um, wait, what is this first one? Oh, the relationships between the simple gas laws. So the simple gas law, or this column. So if we have constant quantities of N and T, then we can have PV, P1V1 equals P2V2, or Boyle's law. If number of moles and pressure is constant, then we get Charles' law. If we have pressure and temperature constant, which is one we didn't talk about, or sorry, if we have number of moles and volume constant, that's Gay-Lussac's law, which is P1 over T1. Um, and then you can always rearrange the ideal gas law to solve for any of these things. Uh, yeah. Let's leave it there. And then we'll come back to the ideal gas law and I can reintroduce it Thursday, finish this up. <laughs>